A loco AI chatbot? I don't want to log in, dude. Did it hurt when you fell from the battle bus? Riz me up, Protoss? I think I've seen enough. I think I've seen enough already. I think that's all we need to see. As far as that loco AI chatbot goes. That is how I talk, by the way. Yeah, I do talk about battle buses and raising a lot. Absolutely. I don't know, the whole AI thing's always kind of creeped me out a bit. I've had a bunch of people make loco-related AIs. And while it's kind of fun, it's also a little creepy, you know? Because, like, some of them really do sound like me, and you can make them say whatever. Which is, you know, there's definitely going to be some drama over the next couple years about AI bots saying something that streamers have allegedly said, but streamers never actually did say, but there's no way to prove that you didn't. It's weird, man. It's going to blur some lines for sure. Yeah, you, you could have that voice, call my grandma and ask for money, and my grandma might believe you. Now, I've told my grandma that I'm not going to be calling her and asking for money, but, <laughs> you know, these are like, you could literally have, uh, this will be perfect, Lopo, you can say anything on streaming, you say, well, I don't really try to say dumb very frequently, right? I do say dumb stuff every once in a while, but I don't know. Yeah, imagine if AI Loco says something terrible, like, I enjoy League of Legends. Oh my god. That would be terrible. There's some messed up things a person can say, and that is definitely at the top of that pyramid. Yeah. I just got timed out for saying this. It's not that bad, is it? Is it? What does that word mean? I don't know what that word means. He looks extra... Okay, I'm gonna... I'm gonna Google it. He looks... Fat. Untidy and dirty. Excessively casual. That's apparently what that word means. Here's what the loco chatbot sounds like. Hey, Darth. Which Protoss unit would be your significant other? <laughs> no, no. No, that does not sound really like me. I can I can kind of see the, the... Yeah, no. I can kind of hear it a little bit, but that thing has a, a thicker Dutch accent than me. Look at what the stupid balance team did to the mech players. Last year they said they finally want to see more mech games in the Pro, so they enhanced Cyclone, and then on March they changed it back because they think it's too much in the game. The Widow Mine have been fine in ladder for over four years, and now suddenly they said it becomes too much damage to their beloved Protoss players. I've been playing mech for almost 10 years, not only because I love SC1 and SC2 Terran mech force, but also I am old. My APM can no longer rival my young age level, especially when I'm tired from work and just want to have fun. Yeah, let's not pretend like you've, you used to be quick, okay? I will agree that there is going to be a little bit of degradation in in-game speed and APM. But there's a lot of players out there like, no, 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 I am now of the ripe old age of 34 and I am unable to hit the keyboard as quickly as I used to when I was 21. I think you've always been slow, man. I think you've always been pretty slow. Let's be real here for a second. There's some guitar players out there that are doing the craziest solos well into their 80s, man. There's no way. Now, unless you have some sort of like, you know, if you have a condition, fair, different. But whenever I see people making that excuse, I used to be quick, but now no longer. I don't know, man. I'm not I'm not convinced that that is, that is the case. 80 pen cent of Terran army are mech yuntis, and any combination of mech units can make the tactic and the game much more diversified and wonderful. But nowadays, you rarely see any mech player in ladder, especially when you are masters or above. This inexplicable hatred from balance team to mech player confused me for 10 years, so I really don't see too much mech games in the pro. Instead, I have been, or I have seen the boring MMM, the Marine Marauder Medivac army for 10 years, and I still cannot learn anything from their micro talent. Oh my god, it keeps going. I think I may quit StarCraft 2 in several weeks if mech is still suck like this, because I am just desperately disappointed. I casted a uh, Terran vs. Zerk yesterday between Cure and Rogue. Now, I don't want to spoil my own stuff all too much, but um, let's just say that Cure absolutely murdered Rogue. Yeah, that's a bit of a spoiler, but it wasn't even close. And he played eight, eight factory, four command center, full Terran mech right from the start. Yeah, he's not happy. There's no profile. Normally, there's a button to go to the man's profile, but apparently... Either he has no games logged, or he's hidden the profile button. The thing is, Darren Mech is not played very frequently at the pro level, but it is still played. It is viable at every level below the tippity top. So like, unless this guy, Eddie Soen, is 
one of the top 25 players in the world, I think he can play Terran Mech. Yeah, I don't think some of the Widow Mine nerfs were really needed. I do think some of it could certainly be set with some nuance, but like, people are being overly dramatic, right? Like, this is one of those, those classic things you see for many, many years in everything. I think I may quit StarCraft 2 in several weeks if mechs still suck like this. I think what happened is he lost the game against somebody who was much faster than him, and then he got very angry and he wrote this essay. That's probably what happened. What a joke from a Zerg player's comment. How many Grandmaster mech player with only 100 APM do you see on the ladder? Bro, there's like no one in Grandmaster League with only 100 APM though. <laughs> like, there may be a handful and they're probably all Terran mech players, but it's not really, uh, it's not really a thing that gets played that much in the first place, man. They exist, yeah. But 100 APM is not considered very fast. Not in Grandmaster League, anyways. Yeah, Goody still plays, it's actually fun. The Panzer General used to be a German pro gamer about a decade ago. Zerk is the easiest race ever. Everyone knows that. There's actually not that many Zerks right now in Grandmaster League. So there's a little bit of a uh, feeling, this, this is a bit of an emotional post chat, rather than one where we're discussing facts. It's a bit dishonest. Yeah, what did Artosis call that again? Intellectually dishonest, that's it, yes. Clem can sometimes beat Serral? Yeah. Clem is, um... <laughs> what the heck is this? What? <laughs> oh, come on! They're letting the pro gamers play this <laughs> Oh my god, okay, well, I'm gonna watch this segment. You wear it? You love it. Hello, guys. I'm from DKZ Oliveira. Hello, everyone. I'm Nice. I'm Portos player. So we're going to play this fishing game. So let's say Grey Spider. You can throw you You How did you do it? <laughs> it's so stupid. Oh, okay. Noted. Thank you, Nolan. Uh, I will write it down. Did he just cheat? Uh, Did Olivera uh, just grab uh, one of the fish? Uh, uh, oh. Rain or nice? Game three. Uh, okay. Uh, 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 Why can't my fish get up? Dude, this goes on for ages, man. <laughs> it just keeps going. Are they finishing the whole game? They're not even fighting over the last one. Nice, living up to his username there. Okay, so I'm so going to fish king. One, two, three, four, five, six. No need to count, I win. Nine, eight, seven, 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 eight, but it works. Slightly sweating. Just a little bit of sweat. <laughs> no, don't <f> die. <laughs> okay, I think I'm done. I think I'm finished with the game. Very fun though, guys. Oh no, there's one more thing I wanna do. This is the perpetual just five more minutes. There's, there's a lot more just five more minutes moments. I want to go to the bunny and activate the remote. Okay. This is where we activate the remote control apparently and we get a control panel. Oh my god, I can flip the different things. What do you want me to do? I can draw a wiener on the board? I don't know what the point of this is. What's the point of drawing wieners, guys? I think I'm gonna watch that video. Help us solve the animal well bunny 
Mural. Controls allow you to draw whatever you want up there. Yeah. But what is it that we have to draw? Because you know there's got to be something. Well, if you have the top, dig down here and you'll find this. Except yours is probably going to look different. Because... What? Dude, I never see where I'm supposed to use the top. That is basically an invisible tile to me. Wow. Okay. So there are 50 unique puzzle pieces. And obviously we need all 50 to solve this. It's a community puzzle. So if you want to help solve it, just take a picture of it with the snipping tool or something and post that in the spoiler channels of either my Discord or the Animal Well Discord. And let's get this thing solved. That's all for now. I've got many videos of this game on the way. Things are going to go much, much deeper than I even imagined. All right, for now. It's a community puzzle, as in like everybody gets their own 4x4 and you have to figure out what the full screen looks like. So what does the full screen look like? This was posted three weeks ago. I'm assuming this guy posted an update video. That is pretty sick. Look, at least 50 people working together. Tech Raptor spearheaded the attempts to solve this thing from the very beginning. And with an amazing community and a lot of community involvement, it was successfully solved. This image right here shows every single one of the unique pieces. So if you would like to try to solve it yourself. So if you are, for example, Zero Mancer, right? How the f are you ever gonna figure out? It's just the it's just blue. Mine is also mostly blue. I would have never thought about this being like a community jigsaw puzzle. That makes no sense. Oh, from here, <laughs> please stop the video now and do so because I'm about to show you exactly what the finished mural looks like. Anyway, I solved this for the first time live on stream and I actually made a mistake with one pixel, but this time we're not making any mistake. We're just finishing this one <laughs> final flower and placing one Last pixel. And there we go. The door opens on the right, and we have a nice new piece of artwork decorating the well. And in here, we have probably the coolest looking of all of the bunnies, rabbits. Bunny number one, rescued from the well. All right, so I am about to spoil an ability that you have from the very beginning of the game that the game does not tell you about. But this ability is required in order to figure out how to solve this next one. What? Anyway, there's your warning. Did you know that you had the ability to manipulate things in the environment using your mouse or your PS5 touchpad or your Switch touchscreen? Yes, you may have noticed it without actually noticing it. Also, real quick, if you put the game into a window on PC and shake that window around, I did do that. you also manipulate the physics of the environment like that. Why what? does he have 10 Here's times as hint. much hits points so, as me? So close to the beginning of the jungle, right here on the map, once you have this door open, the vines growing from the ceiling in the room inside can be moved to reveal directional inputs. Yeah. Anyway, I'm just going to go into the next room right now and then play those notes on the flute. And you suddenly teleport to a small chamber with the next bunny. And if you press this button, it actually reveals that you are directly above the room below, the one containing the future egg. Nice. These numbered stone symbol markers, what do they mean? Well, they are scattered all across the center of the world. You won't find any too high on the map, and you won't find any too low on the map. That's one hint. This one is very surprising, as are a lot of the secrets in this game, very outside the box. Are you ready for this reveal? Have you wondered why exactly you have a pencil in this game? The other upgrades are really cool, but then getting 16 eggs just gives you a pencil. Yes. Yeah, it's useful to write on the map. You can use it to draw all the teleport codes on your map as well. Right. It must be for something else, right? It can't just be for I think that. it's for drawing we dicks the on the map. to mark the map. That's gotta be Why it, no? pencil? Oh, 
Yeah, you connect the dots, of course, in a game filled with so many other children's toys. Why not connect the dots? Anyway, the code is 67234353. Right as the last note escapes your flute, you are teleported to another secret little nook. A tunnel leading to the next secret bunny. This was actually the first hidden one I ever found. When exploring the world with the UV lamp, you might <laughs> notice some strange glowy particles. Sorry, what? When exploring the world with the UV lamp? I'm sorry, what? Particles in certain spots. <laughs> These can appear in some other rooms, but in my experience- Marco, how, yeah, how did you not figure this out? I know, guys. You will most commonly find them in the large central room Embarrassing, with the I didn't figure this and out. And what does this signify? Oh my god, it's a bunny. Of course it's a bunny. An invisible bunny that only appears under UV light. I like, by Not the way, how there's clips in this in this video of him playing 75 hours. And now there's a clip of him playing at the 39 hour mark again. So this guy's been wandering around for like... <laughs> like 35 of this... UV light. Nice. Honestly, mm. I have no real guide. To acquiring this one the way that i personally did it was i just wandered around the main room exiting and then re-entering again and then eventually when i let my guard down and didn't think i was gonna find it there it is just chase that thing down make sure you grab it before it disappears doesn't this fish look weird oh they're notes this fish mural was hiding a secret all this time and those directions are Left, left, diagonally down right, right, diagonally upright, left, left, diagonally upright. Or five, five, two, one, eight, five, five, eight. The flute should be ten times After louder than that it is, song, dude. A trap door opens oh on the far God. right side of this room. And inside the next secret bunny. What's the Hiding point of right the secret bunnies, the guys? Damp Does anybody understand the point of the secret bunnies? I don't like. It's not that I don't like bunnies. Don't get me wrong. Yes. Towards the end of the end game area, right here on the map, you could jump through this wall to reveal the skull room and this curious structure right okay, here. Okay, I'm gonna fast Naturally. forward a little bit. All right. So what is BDTP? Well, bunny data transfer protocol, most likely. In programming, a nibble is four bits, so like 0010, and a crumb is two bits, so like 01. Because of the computer lingo, you might think that DIR0 and DIR1 stand for directory 0 and 1, but you would be wrong. Instead, they stand for direction 0 and direction 1. Huh? If you've gotten up to this point in the game yourself, you may have already realized that the sky infinitely loops upwards and downwards. However, some of us had a theory that there might be a Lost Woods type of puzzle up here. And guess what, guys? That was correct. And the way that we figured out which directions to travel in was by reading the ears of the bunnies. Billy Basso, the developer of this game, actually encoded information in the ear animations of all 16 of these bunnies. But figuring out the index is how we figure out which order these directions come in. I'm just going to run across the bunny platform from left to right and give you that order right now. The index of the bunnies is 0, 9, 5, 1, 14, 13, Seven, two, three, six, eleven, twelve, ten, fifteen, eight, four. And then, of course, the flag drawing on the blackboard gives us the hint that you begin at the flag. Are you ready? Let's go up. Left. He's controlling that thing? Up. Left. He's playing a different game than me. Up. Well, look at the origami bunny. Yeah, right. after this. Up. Up again. Left. Down. 
left. This is so dumb. Oh. Th that's an insane secret, dude. Up again. How do the community, uh, how, how do again. people figure this out within a month of the game's release? Right. Oh, it's Easter right eggs again. and Easter bunny? Do you reckon that's the, that's Down. the pun? Right. Yeah, this is way past fun for me. Absolutely. Up. But I understand that there's people out there that like up again. absolutely and love up digging up more. all the secrets. Yeah. Left. It's not really me, but yeah, puzzle people are very puzzling. Down. Look at this. Left. Up. But as a game developer, do you wonder Left. if at some point you put in too much? Like there's got to be some that's up. like not found, right? And that may have never been found. Right. Right again. This is one of those very right, vague, more very obscure puzzles. So you need to look at the ears of the bunnies because supposedly it gives you an indication. Up. And finally left. And we find ourselves at a large structure floating hidden in the sky. The bunny temple with quite ominous music I love playing. no I love the idea of adding stuff for like 1% of the player base but this is not 1% of the player base <laughs> There's probably one person okay maybe five people maybe after watching this video there were a couple more but like when this video <laughs> got released there's probably like two dudes that figured this out but this guy probably had like, you know, the most beautiful climax when he figured this out. Like he, yeah, no, I, I, I'm glad I'm not in the room when this guy figured this out. Let me, let me put it like that. Yeah, it was nasty. Gotta clean his monitor. It's a, it's a bit of a disaster. Why, hello there. <laughs> oh, wouldn't it be funny if it just ended right there? Deletes your save. <laughs> so we're gonna travel through the digestive tract of this gigantic bunny, and then with a we pop out the other side. But wait, something feels different. And as I walk slowly to the precipice, it's then that I notice my blue eyes. Jumping into the air, I sprout wings. You gain the ability to transform into a moth and fly infinitely at high speed when you double jump and it allows you to explore this world so much faster. Another jaw-dropping, mind-exploding moment in a game filled with jaw-dropping, mind-explody moments. It's crazy, but this is not the end. What in the, the next video, we'll be exploring even deeper. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a fantastic day. And hey, I stream on Twitch at twitch.tv slash furyforged, and okay. I have a Discord server. Also All right, we'll let the sellout happen, sure. Sorry, origami, or origami? Somebody said origami is the insane one. Where do I find the origami bunny? No, he earned that sellout, 100%. This guy did like, yeah, exactly. He did seven years of puzzling and within the release of the game, like the first month. Egg code and the office? And now we have what has already become one of my favorite video game secrets of all time. First you find the flute, which itself is amazing, and then you realize, okay, each note corresponds to a number, one through eight, but there's more. Looking at it with the UV lamp reveals a green bar above one, through the middle of two, and at the bottom of four. The plot thickens. And then, running over to the main egg chamber, once you acquire all 64 eggs and your collection is complete, looking at them under the UV lamp reveals an entire secret code. You can either count these up manually or look at them as if- Look, I like video games. <laughs> Actually, I would say I love video games. I have been playing video games for a very long time. <laughs> but this, this, this is, this I would never figure out. I would never figure this out. This could be binary, it could be many things. But my, like this, this guy probably understands the movie Inception. This guy probably watched Inception the first time and he's around and he's like, yeah, no, but what, what's the problem? I mean, it makes perfect sense. It's a dream within a dream with, yeah, of course. They're binary. For example, the top left egg has a middle line and a bottom it line. It is binary. So that would be two and four. 
I added them up to 6. And then you play the note corresponding to that number. In this case, 6 is diagonally up left. So this guy, However, like you have to in binary read this and then play 64 notes. I wasn't able to immediately solve it because at first I was skipping all the blank eggs. But instead, those blank eggs represent 8, which is diagonally up right. But it hides yet another cheeky... Why would the empty eggs be diagonally upright? It could be any of the other five notes. The little trick. The upside down egg. Yeah, you actually have to... 1,000 is eight in binary? Ah! <laughs> oh, I see. Triple, yeah, triple zero is... Okay. See? Flip that's that around. That's very clever. But that's the kind of shit I don't pick up on immediately. So instead of an upper line and a middle line, you have a middle line and a bottom line, which is another six. Anyway, all together, these are the notes you need to play. There are a lot of them, so take your time. Besides, the song is hauntingly beautiful. I think it's actually so cool to put in like this. Thinking it over a little bit more. The game developer clearly made, you know, like 99% of the game pretty accessible, right? Or maybe not 99, but like 95% of the game. People, like the vast majority of people probably unsubscribe or like, you know, uninstall whenever they're finished, right? They defeat the final boss. But to like continue adding more shit out there and to watch the entire video game community come together and solve your game, it's actually really cool. Yeah, unsubscribe, uninstall, whatever. As you play that last note, the wall in the upper right of the room opens, revealing yet again another passageway. However, this one does not lead to a bunny. It leads to something far more interesting. Wait a minute. An office, office key? key? What? Yes, it does. Welcome to your office. Containing a computer that you can interact with. Hmm. I wonder what that's doing right now. And then in the far corner, BDTP. Ah, uh, that is where this previous puzzle index, was at. Directory zero, directory one. Yeah. However, late that night when I solved this. Well, this is probably the most Oh, there's more? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Zero directory one? Question mark? Sure enough, there's even this more information the under UV light. However, late that night when I solved this, I decided to go into the other room where my printer was. Yes, it actually prints instructions for you to make your own origami bunny containing a puzzle. And yes, that was me in a full body green screen suit. <laughs> Anyway, after you construct your origami bunny and solve the puzzle... It sends a print instructor to your printer? <laughs> Is that allowed in the beautiful country of Europe? Chat, I am fairly sure your software is not allowed to print shit without me giving explicit permission Logo, for that. Permission but anyways... To use guides going forward. <laughs> I just can't with this game. Yeah, thank you, Mickey. Yeah, no, that is, that is insane. Oh my god. What if you don't have a printer? Well, I mean, if you don't have a printer, that's... And play those notes on the flute. Uh, I have a printer, but I think my default printer is a printer I haven't used in about a decade because it's dead and I don't even have the printer anymore, but I never changed the default printer. You unlock the origami <laughs> figure as well as an origami bunny jumping out of the computer screen. Oh my god. But That's wait, amazing. I don't have a printer. That's all right. If you're on console or you just don't have a printer, you can solve that puzzle right here, which is right here on the map, by the way. See, I'm taking care of you. You might be able to even do this straight from my video, but that grass... You can scan that grass as a barcode. And then that barcode gives you the same notes that you got from the origami. Playing that song here... <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, of course. It opens a... the floor beneath you, 
revealing the chamber with a chest in it with the Mama Cha figurine. So you're going to want to do this anyway, even if you did already get the bunny from the origami. And then this is where the bunny will be if you didn't already get it in the office. And then here's a URL, which I'll link down below as well, where you can get the instructions. You can either print them up. It might not be good quality though from this, or you could just follow the directions directly from this Google Doc with your own piece of paper. But yeah, that whole process, reading the code on the eggs, unlocking the office, making, I made that origami bunny at like 3 a.m. one night. Just like, I'm sitting here just like folding paper, like trying to follow the directions. Like, oh my God, what the hell? Anyway, let's go to the next one. After that one, this one is very simple. We're starting up here in Dogtown at the M-Disc Shrine because we need to activate that. Teleport back to the hub. We need the cog, the ghost dog, the cat dog to follow us. Jump into the jungle teleporter, fall down, run one screen to the left, fall down again. You're gonna have to get through this little puzzle real fast. And then up there at the top right, doesn't that look like a dog statue, but it's like wearing a bunny costume with ears and a tail? Yeah. Just wait here, and then as soon as the cat dog touches it, it turns into a bunny. Just make sure you collect it real fast and then get out of there. Teleport back to the hub, jump into the dog teleporter, and then you're gonna have to go through the whole process of returning the mock disc. Or I guess you could just die at this point if you're okay with that. But if not, you gotta go all the way back to the M-Disc shrine. And that's that. There is actually only one more bunny left, and this is a fun one. All right, so in this room in the top left corner of the map, above Swordfish Lake, we have ourselves another bunny. I wonder why there's a save point up there. <laughs> this one- Do you think getting laid is more satisfying than figuring out these Easter eggs, Fabula? No, 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 no. Most likely want the better bubble wand for, and you, you're gonna need the disc. If you don't have I don't the have disc, that you bubble should wand. have it I, by I don't now, even know but how if you don't, it. make sure you have it. Above where the swordfish jumps out, there's a little <laughs> passageway up here. Now, take a deep breath, guys. You got past the swordfish. Oh no. So in order to successfully get through this room, you have to practice the forward disc riding or the jumping disc ride technique, which does take a little bit of practice to get right, as you can see. Basically, you wanna jump forward and throw the disc when you're at the height of your jump. If you time it and you have to time this on the way back as well. Air, you're gonna jump directly onto your disc. As you can see, you're gonna have to do it twice in a row. And congratulations. That was the final bunny. What happens now? All right. Okay. I wanna. He uploaded another video. The ultimate secret ending of Animal Well. Massive endgame spoiler? That's okay. After dude. first finding all of the eggs and especially freeing all of the secret bunnies, there is still one gigantic secret quest line that we currently know about in Animal Well, and that involves the exceptionally well hidden Unicode symbols. Each of these messages is obtained by performing some out of the box feat by speedrunning, sequence breaking, or otherwise annoying certain denizens of the well. And it all leads to an absolutely spectacular payoff. There will absolutely be extreme spoilers for the end game or what we currently know as the end game in this video so please keep that in mind and only watch this if you don't care about being spoiled or you've already reached this point in the game and sure. are stuck yeah that's that right. just let's, let's just pretend that i'm gonna play until this point sure begin all right, this first one involves the step counter at the very top of the well right here. There's some ground on the right-hand side that you can dig through with the top. You guys, you guys you all made it to this point too, right? You've unlocked all the secret bunnies, did the whole code. You've sung all the songs. All right, you got, yeah, now, now that I know that you guys have, yeah, okay, perfect. Inside of this Tamagotchi pedometer, <laughs> when your step count of is- Of course, there's a- t <laughs> Right, there's a, all right. Remember, remember when you first got to the Tamagotchi? Remember that point? Right. Below 100. Yeah. So the way to do uh, this I is remember. actually when your step count reaches 100,000, it actually rolls back over to zero afterwards. Oh. So when your step count is getting Just like my car. Wait, no, no sure joke. Get up joke. here and get inside this thing so that you can reach this chest at step count 99. 
And there it is. That's illegal, Chet. Don't there roll back your fucking car. This footage comes from my stream because you can actually only ever see this one once. So that little guy right there, Mr. Purple or whatever you want to call him, there are statues of it all around the well. And you can see in this very old footage that it used to be an enemy design, which based on the way that it follows the player character here was probably replaced by those creepy lorises, the things that follow you constantly. Yeah. Interestingly, though, its graphics still exist within the data. So will it become possible for us to turn into this ourselves or possibly wake Mr. Purple and then have to run away from him throughout the entire well? Wouldn't that be cool? Anyway, moving on. And now it's time to annoy the hummingbird. Yes. I found this is the easiest way to do this. Just spam bubbles with the better bubble wand down here in the middle of the well. And then when you have a huge amount of them rising to the top of the screen, climb the ladder right here. The hummingbird is going to immediately try to pop them all and you can hear the sound of its wings crescendo. Once it gets to around this point, we're probably good right now. I just wanted to make sure. So I just kept spamming these bubbles. You just want to make sure that the sound from the hummingbird rises as high as it can go and then stays there for a little while. So maybe around five seconds. After it successfully pops all the bubbles, it'll fly back to its perch and then curse you out in Unicode. <laughs> <laughs> After you free all of the Lynx kittens, so, the mama- so Is this all going to culminate to like something? Is it like- <laughs> It's so- It's so random. Uh, sings you a song. But what if I was to tell you that if you never free those Lynx kittens and you come here and sing that song yourself, the cage still opens and you can still get the wheel. Without wrong warp glitches, this does require at least 32 eggs because you need the top in order to dig in on this side or the other side. And then we're just gonna jump over here and stand on top of the cage and then play these notes. Opens, carefully bubble down to it, and now we have access to the wheel. <laughs> you don't have and enough to free. The third and it gives you the third message. code. Oh, if you don't okay. mind wrong warping, then you can get there with just the bubble wand and the flute. So all you need is eight eggs. From the spawn location, we're just going to stand right up here, blow a bubble, and then you want to kind of have one foot on the bubble and one foot on solid ground. And then you just play the first seven notes of the hub warp song, and then you get a pause buffer. So basically what we're doing is just continuously pausing right. the game in order to get the animation state of the bubble to look the way we need it to. Right, which yeah, is no, this obviously. right here. You want to make Naturally. sure the bubble looks like that. And then quickly unpause the game and play that last note, and you should, if you did it right, teleport directly onto the cage in the Lynx room. From there, you can just get the wheel. Now, for this I like next how it just one, we have to be an that I still don't understand. Gremlin to this guy right here, which will probably be easy for you judging by how many times this thing jump scares you throughout the game. <laughs> We're going to have to get the kangaroo trapped on a screen and then continuously throw firecrackers hey, at it. That's a barcode, by the way. Did you guys know that? And this is the easiest place to do that, right. which is right here on the map in Dogtown. We have to first make sure that the trap door is open in order for the kangaroo to get stuck. So here are the flute notes in order Step to do kangaroo? that. Then just track down the no, kangaroo sorry, sorry, sorry. at each of his locations here, 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 or here until you get it here. There's no easy way to do this. You're just going to have to keep traveling around the world until it happens to spawn in the right spot. Then finally, once it's here, it should get trapped down there, unable to run away as you continuously you, toss firecrackers at it. What a horrible blob you are. Anyway, eventually it will escape and run away, but while it does so, it will yell at you in this Unicode. Here's where things get a whole lot more complicated because we have to catch- Sorry, sorry, what? So the previous one was follow this 69 step procedure and this one is gonna get complicated? What do you mean? five squirrels in one run. I'm going to show you a full walkthrough right now of the five Yeah, that you better I be recording too, by the way, because otherwise you missed it. Now you have to replay the entire game because it only shows you that freaking Unicode once for like two seconds. Based on Discord user Flan's instructions. Flan being the Discord member who originally Dude, caught the weirdest thing about this game, Dynamite, he asks, can we interview the creators? This game is made by one guy. 
One the squirrels dude. to get this Unicode. Anyway, you gotta make sure you start from a fresh save because those Music, squirrels everything. will not respawn once you scare them away, giving you a very limited one amount of tries killer. in order to it's do this. All it took to make the this first game. one we're gonna go for is actually down there at the entrance to the fish biome, but we're going to it go only took up one here psychopath. first in order to flip this lever at the entrance of Dogtown. <laughs> trust me. Then fall all the way back down and then jump through the wall right here. What Unfortunately, a couple of these person. squirrels are much more easily <laughs> snuck up on by using a controller because the analog stick allows the you to Dexter. just very gently the tilt Dexter it of game in order to extremely slowly sneak up behind these guys. Anyway, if this is your first one, then you'll also get the sneak up on a squirrel achievement oh, right now. Nut. Anyway, for the second one, we're gonna start at the lever up there right in front of Dogtown and you need the bubble wand for this. So I'm just gonna bubble upwards. You could get up here a little bit faster, but I was being very careful. And then just bubble across, stay as close to the ceiling as you possibly can without messing yourself up. Cause you do not want to spook the squirrel. And keep in mind also that you can save your game. Please save your game during this process. Cause nothing is worse than getting far into it and then messing up and having to start all over again. Anyway, floating down very slowly allows you to get that second one. Now I'm just gonna That's take a nuts. quick detour to grab this key from the entrance of the jungle biome. And we're not gonna use that key right up there to unlock that door, even though there's a squirrel right on the other side. We will be back for that squirrel later, don't you worry. We need this key in order to get the next squirrel. So I'm here at the disc maze in Dogtown and just follow my path here. I'm just gonna fall down here and then go into this shark pipe. On the other end of the shark pipe, we'll have access to this dark cavern in the Twilight Forest location. You can never want to call it. And we gotta do an interesting bit of sequence breaking right here in order to get the yo yo. We just wanna bubble up carefully into the corner here, and then doing so correctly should allow you to pass the bird. Now I'm just going to show you what it looks like in slow motion to show you exactly where I was when that happened. There you go. Once you get past this bird, just continue on. We're actually not going to get this squirrel right here in this guide. For now, we're just going to continue on until we get to this room. Don't climb down the ladder, just fall and your momentum should be enough to get you past that bird. Again, just like so. And now just continue over to the right in order to access the room where you get your yo-yo, which is very necessary for this next squirrel. All right, now we're at the groundhog save point. Make sure you save your game just in case. And then go over here, and we're gonna use that key from the jungle to unlock that door, and then we're gonna use the yo-yo Oh, to I wanted to go over door. here, but... Now, from here, we just wanna fall down, and then go over to the right. I didn't have and a key. And the squirrel is directly below us right here. We're gonna get you. Anyway, I'm just gonna position myself, fall straight down off that ledge, shoot a bubble, and then float ever so slowly and gently down to spook that next squirrel and collect the nut. Congratulations. All right, I'm just gonna speed this footage up a lot in order to show- Okay, you let's go to the final part of the squirrel. Because you're too close to the wall. Then you wanna walk almost off of your bubble in order to reach this next squirrel. As soon as you see the prompt, just spam it. And the description of the nut will actually show you Biggie, the big mode mascot, along with the fifth Unicode message. Woo. It's way right. better when they now, collect the nuts slowly. You that was well, difficult. you gotta go on the, on the bubble, card guy. You gotta just float down on the bubble and connect. But, but you, gotta, you gotta spam the button though, because you don't wanna miss collecting the nut. Well, I hope that explains it. In order to better. collect the sixth Unicode message, you have to speedrun the game. You have to get the leave the well ending in under an hour, <gasps> which is pretty difficult. But keep in mind, you only need 32 eggs to do this. You can use the first manticore to come out here. Oh, only, and only, any okay, so you only need to do the, okay, right. You only need to do what I did in about 11 hours. Is including wheel warping and bubble warping also count. You can do that. All you gotta do is just reach this point, the second cuckoo clock, in under an hour. Because that final door will be open, and the description of the donkey figurine will be that sixth Unicode message. Okay. GG. <laughs> oh, I know you've been wondering what this thing is all about. What even is it? Guys, this is a groundhog, and the groundhog is shy. It hides in its hole. But isn't there like a real world day when a groundhog right, right. We figured Unicode that one out. message number seven?
full of four. And you can even notice that the flask the elixir is in grows emptier the more you sip from it. It's a nice touch. But anyway, for our purposes here, we only need to do this once. That's because the iguana in the jungle actually I don't know only what Groundhog Day is. I've never even heard of Groundhog Day before. But... Does eight damage when it eats you. It does not Is this an American you. thing? So if you have just is this one an American heart, moment? you survive it. It spits you out and then belches some Unicode at you. Unicode message number seven. Only one more left. It's a movie? All right, this final challenge requires you to eat 100 berries from around the world at full health without taking a single point of damage. So make sure you start this one by first dying in order to reset them all because you don't want to start eating a bunch of these all around the world only to run out because you didn't respawn them all. So very carefully travel around the world eating berries and then as you progress, save your game. Eventually you'll find that last berry and when you eat it, those little squiggles above your head turn into the final Unicode message. We are finished. Not really. Now that we have all of these, what do they even mean? Well, that's the crazy part, how this was solved. It all comes down to this poster. Somebody had an idea and ran with it, and it ended up actually working. What? That somebody was Plumerant, and this was the idea. Yep. There are eight different colors on this poster, and the eight different Unicode messages can be fit inside of each, resulting in this, a map. Each of the arrows shows a direction, each of the squares is a screen, it shows the blob as the starting location, and it shows an interesting structure at the end. But where is that starting location? I think if you give me a hundred years, right? A hundred years, I would not figure any of this shit out. I'm not even joking. If I didn't have internet and a hundred years of my time and I only played this, you would absolutely blow my mind. I would be at the age of 131. You would show me some of this shit. and I'm like, what? That makes no sense. Why right here, of course. Now, one more journey through the stars. Let's go. Left. Left. Up. Left. So first you have Down. to become the moth. And then from left, the moth, you, you, up, okay. Left, down, down, right, down, up, okay. down, get left, and left. And now we find yet another floating island. This one with some soil we can dig through with the top. Get it? Top soil? Okay. Anyway, digging to the bottom reveals a time capsule. I'm going to show you this entire thing right now without editing and without talking from beginning to end. And then after that will be a little bit of an outro with a few theories. So if you would like to see what's inside the time capsule for yourself, please stop the video now or skip Bro, to the next. Chapter. I'm not going to do any anyway, of it. <laughs> let's do this. What do you mean? It would take me a year. Date is March 12th, 2024. This is Billy Basso, the developer of the game you're playing. I'm recording this as one of the last things I do before submitting for certification. If you're hearing this, that means that you just solved a set of puzzles that I honestly did not really design to be solvable. Um, I didn't even expect people to discover them. So I'm kind of taking this opportunity right now to break the fourth wall and personally congratulate you. Um, whether you did it legitimately, or you hacked the game, or you just looked this up online. Uh, either way, I'm very, very proud of you. Good job. <laughs> the developer! The developer congratulates you! <laughs> Good job. Wow. That's what my mom never said to me. At least Billy did it. This is Dan Aiden. I help Billy Basso with the business and marketing side of Animal Well. Billy has been telling me for years about all of these crazy puzzles that he was putting into the game. And I kept telling him that no one would ever even realize these puzzles were in the game, much less figure them out. Billy being Billy was okay with that since he'd know they were there. So if you're listening to this, congratulations, you proved me wrong. Your tenacity to uncover the secrets buried deeply in the shadows 
has me equally impressed and slightly worried about whatever else you might set your mind to. For that, I congratulate you, and I fear you. Hey, it's Donkey. I've been trapped inside of the game's code for 277 years, and I just wanted to say thank you for releasing me from this game. It was a good game. Uh, I like the part with the ostrich and the bean monkey is, you know, I love him. And maybe I can go play Animal Well 2 now by the time you've discovered this. Dude! Aww. The developers thought that this was actually going to take years and years and years to solve. And they did it in a month? You're almost disappointed at that point, dude. Like, you want it to be solved. But at the same time, you don't really want it to be solved. You know what I mean? Like, you want this to be solved after like eight years where somebody's like, wait a second, hold up right now. So, video game donkey, I think he, he owns the publishing company for this particular game, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, that's why he's in it. Some nice messages from the people involved in the creation of this masterpiece of a game. And you actually get to keep these headphones on as long as you keep your save loaded. And at the end, the way Dunkey says, I've been trapped inside of the game's code for 277 years, and thank you for releasing me, makes me think that's a hint. Together with the headphones and the fact that the official Big Mode YouTube channel has uploaded, so far, two hour-long videos of just the game's ambience in certain areas. And then there's one final thing. Accessing the time capsule removes this wall separating the tutorial area from the end game area. Some people think it's a bug, because if you lay the sky map over the map of the well, then these missing blocks are the exact blocks you destroy with the top in order to access the time capsule. However, this does look, to me, to be intentional. Has opening this route changed anything else in the game? Is it possible to destroy any other walls throughout the world by finding other structures out in the sky? I guess maybe we'll find out at some point. There are a lot of other leads in the secret hunting community, and I'll have more to share with you soon. And the extremely cool collector's edition is on the horizon, which I am going to buy immediately. I hope that it does not- Mate, I <laughs> hope they sent you a dozen copies. I will definitely subscribe. I'll keep an eye out and see if there's anything else. Honestly, really cool. I realize I don't even touch the service of the game. I didn't even touch the service. Insanely cool. I, um, I was pretty happy with my playthrough. I think I did overall pretty well. But it turns out there is uh, a little bit more to it than at first glance. <sighs> so much work, man. Yeah, so supposedly it's one developer who worked on this for seven years. Yeah, I love that games like this are being made. Like, he didn't need to do all of this. Like, he probably spent months just putting in Easter eggs that may never be found. Right? Like, there may be multiple layers still. The fact that there's actually, yeah, that much effort and that much love put into a game is really, really, really cool to me. Um, especially in a time where we have a lot of AAA developers that just try to launch game after game after game and microtransaction after microtransaction and everything. Like, I have nothing against that in particular, but this is more like a, like a labor of love, right? Like, a, like, a, like an actual art piece. Whereas some of these others are just very much so commercial. Anyways, honestly, great game. Highly recommend it. I have 13.4 hours of playtime apparently in total. I think there's about another 100 if you want to, but very fun. I'm going to be uninstalling it. It is a whopping 30 something megabytes. So if I ever want to reinstall it, I think, I think I can do it. Back into 1v1 after like a decade. How to deal with Skytals. I won all my placements against Terran and Protoss, but lost the two Protoss matches. Both went Skytals. I remember the old answer used to be, don't let him get there. But I used to do a two-base swarm host Nidus that did well back for me when Toss went Sky. Seems like swarm... Whoa, wait, this guy went two-base swarm host against a Skytals player? How are we dealing with this now? Do you just Roach Ravager Rush and break in the front door? Oh, he's asking about... When he talks about Skytals, he means like one Skytals unit. So like maybe like a two, you know, or like a triple Oracle opener or something like that. Triple Oracle is just the early game now, right? Like that's uh, this is definitely a little different. 
No, I think he's asking a reasonable question. <laughs> I love the advice. 15 drone, then overlord, then spawning pool, make links, skip gas. Who heart at this? Who gave a little heart? This guy is suggesting a slow zirkling all-in. Against somebody who opens skytals. Target fire, don't just spray your attacks. Mutas, on the other hand, are great for spray fire. Bro, he's asking about skytals. <laughs> don't play mutas against skytals, guys. If you went mass mutas in the first place, you'd already been banging upgrades for air. Ah, uh, no. Oh no. I appreciate the constructive response, guys. I'll be trying them out on the ladder. Apparently, infestors have some sort of air defense ability now that reduces damage taken by 50%. I don't think he even got trolled, man. Now, personally, I can mass muta and kite the interceptors, but I don't know how well your skills at stutter step are. What the f? What are you talking about? You can kill Mass Carrier with Muta by doing this and just destroying their payloads with Splash. This guy's stutter stepping against Interceptors with Mutalisk. And that's what he's suggesting against everybody. Or, or okay. Did I just turn Irish? <laughs> what did I say? This is bad, dude. This is my, my stress. <laughs> what did I say? More like Scottish? I don't remember what I said. I'm trying to retrace my words. It's the music, man. Interest you on a pint? Safe travels. Be good. Irish loco? What the f did I say? What? Okay, I'm gonna... What did I say? What the f What are you talking about? <laughs> you can kill Mass Carrier with Muta by doing this and just destroying their payloads with Splash. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> that wasn't that bad. What are you talking about? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Fair, fair. I'll give you that one. A yeah, sure, sure. A little bit. I do like the BattleNet farms. Remember, remember a couple years ago when the BattleNet farm guys came after me because I made a video about the BattleNet farms. Like I made a video about the BattleNet farms, and I I responded to a bunch of the threats. And then somebody made a threat linking the video and all of the Battle.net forum guys made fun of me. Yeah, like I was mocking the Battle.net forum posters and then I made a video about that and I uploaded that to the channel and then the Battle.net forum posters were mocking my video. And then I was mocking the Battle.net... It was, yeah, there was like a... They called me Bloco! Yes! That was it! One of the guys started calling me Bloco and then they all started calling me Bloco. It was great! And then, and then for a little while... Somebody made an account on the Battle.net forums named Loco, and he ran the same portrait that I usually use in-game. And he started commenting on Battle.net forum posts as if he was me. Yeah, just straight up impersonation. This is the most beef I've ever had in the yeah in StarCraft 2, man. Yeah, I, I, I don't even see those guys anymore, though. I don't really recognize these names. Dear Balance Council, some SOS suggestions. How many times we need to see an offline tournament that something is still terrible wrong with Protoss race? I'm so sad and sick of it that in top 8 Protoss never wins. Here is why. Okay, Dystopia has figured it out, boys. Colossi sucks. Zealot sucks. Stalker sucks. I want to see an immortal cost reduce observer from Nexus or build time reduce for observers. I want to remove sensor tower, have nothing to do with RTS, gives free army movement away, queens some less tankiness. Here are my concrete suggestions. Zealot. Charge gives plus 5 HP and plus 2 damage. Helps in main engages. Yeah, yeah, that would help a lot. Plus new styles more viable like Phonix, Zealot, Gateway style, Gateway style with Storm, Adept and Zealot heavy styles gives new turn. No, you know what would happen if you do this? Every game would be a Zealot online. Yeah. Every game would just be a Zelda villain. This guy is very right, though. Colossi, plus one range and more damage overall versus... Pergananant? Versus... <laughs> These are French marauders, I think. Maradeur. Maradeur. Plus one range and overall more damage versus Maradeur. More consistent damage, more micro potential, fight goes longer, not so easy snipe with Maradeur. 
And now he means it, man. In less unit numbers plus bit more time to focus Vikings with Stalkers makes more risky for the Terran to snipe jump into Colossi. What is good? Longer fights, again, more micro opportunities. More power for Blink Stalkers versus Bio Armies. So Blink upgrade plus 5 HP. Mate, are you losing your mind right now? Plus 5 health when you research the Blink upgrade. <laughs> we only ever see my Stalker, man. More power for Blink Army versus Bio or Ling Hydra Lurker Army overall. More action makes transition a bit smoother. For example, sell it Immortal Storm. Queen less health. You know what I think would be the easiest buff you can give Protoss? I think you should make the Fleet Beacon cheaper. I've been thinking about the Fleet Beacon cost. Fleet Beacon is way too f expensive. 300, 200 is way too much. Like, if we want to give actual buffs, that transition from a ground-based army to a late-game Protoss army with Sky Tools is so f weird. It's so awkward. Tempest also kind of suck. You got to be a little delicate about it, but I think you can probably make it, like, cheaper. 200, 200? No, I think it could probably be like 200, 150 or so. But like at least cheaper. Like 300, 200 is insane, man. It's so expensive. That seems like a bit of a no-brainer buff to me. I think 300, 200 is the most expensive thing in the game. Yeah. How much is a uh, fusion core? It's 150, 150. Why the f is a fleet beacon 300, 200? And a fusion core 150, 150. Actually insane. I think greater spire is fine. Maybe it's... How much is the Greater Spire? Okay, 100 minerals and 150 gas. But that's on top of the Spire, obviously. Yeah. So 300, 350 together. The thing about, like, the Fusion Core is that you make it to upgrade units that you can make without the Fusion Core. Right? Whereas for, like, the Fleet Beacon, you need to make the structure before you can make the units. Which is really awkward. Like, if you want to do, like, the... the e I think the easiest no-brainer buff is to make the f Fleet Beacon cheaper. I think you can make it, like, 200, 200, maybe even 200, 150. I think it'd be a kind of a... Yeah, Battle Cruisers needs a Fusion Core, but, like, nobody plays Battle Cruisers. Fusion Core is actually really cheap. Why is the Fusion Core so much cheaper than a Fleet Beacon? Actually kind of wild. Yeah, maybe because they need a Tech Lab? Maybe. You don't really need a Tech Lab anymore, though, because, like... Advanced Ballistics is over here, and Caduceus Reactor is over here, too. I think Skytoss against Zerg is actually not that good, Barnacle. Now that I'm not really playing much letter myself, I think at the pro level, at least, Skytoss against Zerg is not that good. It's not the way to go anymore, no. I think Skytoss against Terran is even worse. Like, the, the weird thing is that you kind of have to, like, say you're going up against Mass Liberator, you oftentimes, I think you're, like, supposed to go Tempest, at least that's kind of the idea. But Tempest feel really bad. And then you also have to make the, the Fleet Beacon and the additional Stargate, which is really expensive, man. Yep. Yep, yep. Final answer. <laughs> I think it should be a bit cheaper. I have no idea what I'm running through right now, though. I, uh... Fuck me, dude. <laughs> I looked away for a second. Oh my god. Well, I'm dead, I guess. Dude, just getting to this position is hard. Oh, are you <laughs> Um, I don't know how I get over there, guys. I don't know how to get to that spot. Vadi Vidja is like, yo, just go over here. Just, just run through the fog. You can't see where you're going. Just go right over here. Okay. I mean, I figured it wasn't that far. Maybe I'll go from that side instead. I'll go from, from, from right over here. That's what I'll do. Over here is gonna go way better, I'm sure. <sighs> okay. Oh, come on. I had to ban somebody in the chat. The bear does not care. I'm almost there, though. Wait, what? No, I'm getting invaded? Oh, come on, man! <laughs> this is where I needed to be! Yeah, mods were slacking on the job, dude. They had one job and they failed it. You're 200 hours of game time and you're still not done yet? Yeah, I feel like 200 hours is like a pretty good indicator. You're good at games usually too, right, Watopia? So like, probably like a 250 hour... Like, unlike me, you know? Um, this is probably an easy 250 hour game. You follow the checklist so you could do all the NPC quests in the save file. Right. You accidentally did... Wait, you accidentally did 
New game plus? Doesn't it give you like four confirmation screens? And I just complimented you on being pretty good at games. Yet here we are, huh? Here we are. This cave sucks? Well, it's K-lit, so of course it does. I don't remember much about the game, but I, uh, I don't know what this is. Scarlet Rot. Oh yeah! That's why this place sucked, isn't it? Yeah, Scarlet Rot was the, vo the, the worst, man. I found some dragon wound grease. <sighs> Rolling makes it worse. If I want to roll in the Scarlet Rot chat, come on, man, you should just let me. If I want to cover my body in the rot, I feel like I should be allowed to do that. Hello, are you guys the boss? Nope. Oh. Oh, this place. This place might honestly be the worst area I've ever been to, Chet. <laughs> this is this is like multiple sources of damage over time effects. What a what a great what a great place. This this might be worse than Belgium. I mean, it's close. That sounds impossible. Well, I mean, the roads the roads are kind of similar. Like the roads remind me. You're ready for the salt? I don't think there's gonna be any salt today in this game. I'm never salty anyways. What are you trying to suggest, Beinstein? If I didn't know any better, I would think of that as a toxic comment. I get salty easier than you. I do, yeah, I can get kinda salty. Uh, 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 guys, do we wanna get into the drama more? Do we, do we wanna like... So look, we've had this thing in the StarCraft community over the last week or so, right? Where Artosis claims Artosis claims that the best StarCraft 2 player of all time, the greatest of all time, is Rogue. Now, he made a video recently talking about intellectual dishonesty when people discuss who the GOAT is. And Fear Dragon made a response video to that particular video calling out Artosis and the fact that he decided to cherry pick a bunch of results. And now Artosis made a response video to the Fear Dragon video that was a response to the Artosis video. <sighs> What's up, Fear Dragon? <laughs> <laughs> I think we have to. Yeah. I am I am obliged to have a look at this. So I'm going to be reacting to Artosis reacting to Fear Dragon reacting to Artosis. I hope that explains it. I am personally really looking to the Fear Dragon Artosis boxing match that will probably take place sometime in the winter. I, uh, yeah, I think that's, I mean, I would pay for, 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 for tickets for that. Absolutely. I would want to be on the line. I'd want to be, I want to be there. That's going to be the best fight of my life. But anyways, without further ado, I could also react to Steadfast reacting to Artosis, reacting to Fear Dragon, reacting to Artie. Okay. I don't really want to watch the Steadfast video on this though. Yeah, yeah, Fear Dragon versus Artos is in the octagon. The most powerful nerds fight it out. Hey guys, I recently made a video talking about how I think that Rogue is the actual goat and asked for anyone to, uh, <sighs> you know, show I don't me. Even, I don't even want to do this, man, but I'm going to do it anyways. Tell me why that's not the case in a quick, succinct video. Um... Fear Dragon went ahead and did that, so we're gonna go ahead and take a look at this. And I, I, I did just watch this and think about it a little bit, and uh, we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and respond to this. So let's go. Hey Dan, this is gonna be covered on two different videos on Twitter because I don't feel like uploading to YouTube. So first of all, you talked about Premier Weekend tournaments is the main complaint that people have had. First of all, that is near, so basically not in the original video, Artosis picked up this list of tournaments that Rogue has won and that Serral has won. And then because of that, he concluded that Rogue was the greatest of all time, right? Now, I, I watched the original video. I thought it was pretty stupid because about 80% of the tournament results from both players aren't on there. Apparently we're cherry picking results and tournaments based off of our gut feeling, which I think is pretty weird. But anyways, this list was just horribly inaccurate. 
not nearly as many tournaments as Cyril's won in Premier Weekend tournaments. You didn't specify anything besides Premier Weekend tournaments and Premier. I, I did specify uh, online and region lock are not good, but Premier continue. is a category. Of so the tournaments that Artosis doesn't count, from what I understand, are online tournaments and region locked tournaments. I think that is the that is where Artosis cuts the line. I think. Now, in StarCraft 2, on Liquipedia, for every tournament, there is one of three tiers. We have the Premier tier, which is the biggest tournaments, the Major tier, and when we have the Minor tier. Minor is where, like, most of the online, you know, smaller cups are. When it comes to, like, Major tournaments, it's usually, like, the ones with smaller price pools and that are usually quite, you know, maybe not officially region-locked, but that usually have mostly players from one region playing. Tournaments defined on Liquipedia based on prize money and who's eligible to play. So, so, so it's not like the word premier tournament is an arbitrary term. Like, it's just, it's not. It's like something that we have determined and like there is a, there is a categorization. So to suddenly stop using that categorization, I find very weird. But anyways. I want a lot more than those. We'll cover those later. I also mm -hmm. want to just note... I am Katowice 2020 was not, in fact, a global finals event. The global finals event for 2019's year was WC or uh, sorry, BlizzCon. BlizzCon 2019. I am Katowice 2020 was similar to the previous I am Katowice's where it wasn't actually global finals. All right. So real quick on that, I, I if I'm recalling this correctly, uh, BlizzCon that year was canceled due to the COVID stuff um, and... Sorry, what? What the COVID stuff was that? Does anybody know what that is? <laughs> Never heard of that. Then it became obvious that BlizzCon was not coming back, and the World Championship naturally transitioned the the following year to IM Katowice, right? Uh, so I guess technically in 2020 we don't have a world champion, uh, although that would have been it if oh. we had known that BlizzCon. So Artos is saying he counts Katowice 2020 as a world championship in hindsight, because it turned out because of COVID, we couldn't have tournaments at the end of the year anymore. So we're talking. So 2019, November, 2019, Dark wins BlizzCon. February, 2020, Rogue wins IEM Katowice. BlizzCon 2020 gets canceled. So Artie is saying that the World Championship for 2020 should have been Katowice, which was played like eight months prior to that, even though it wasn't originally labeled as a World Championship. But in hindsight, it should have been because in 2020 we didn't have a World Championship because that moved on to then Katowice 2021. So technically speaking, Dark was a World Champion of StarCraft II for a year and three months. So Artie is saying it should have been a world champion for three months instead? That doesn't make any sense, no. Canceled, and like I said, it got transferred over this year. Or in, uh, it got transferred over the next year because there was no more BlizzCons. Uh, and now, in fact, this year, uh, Katowice is not the world championship because it's being transferred over to the Saudi Arabian event. Yeah. Which in, you know, a few years time, if StarCraft is still going but on, carry on. And, uh, <laughs> the Saudi Arabian tournament Your Honor! Out, then it will transfer. Your <laughs> Objection. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hold up. Katowice. So I guess technically this is correct. We could move this down uh, to the the premier weekend tournament yes. with the other lists. of Because that's what Katowice's. it was. Uh, but, you know, that it's it's... It is what it is. Let's go. So, that's one thing. Um, now, you love offline. That is events. one thing. Hold up right now. That's a very significant thing, though. So, Artie is actually saying, yeah, he's saying, it's true. I am got a got a Vitsa 2020 was not a world championship. So, instead, it's a premier weekend tournament. Okay. So let's go. So, that's one thing. Um, now, you So, that already settles the debate, no? It's... <laughs> It, doesn't that settle the debate or do we have, okay well anyways fine events and you love offline wins you categorize them as being more important let's talk about offline victory versus korean i find this this whole thing of not counting online tournaments so i've been thinking about that a lot because i'm a nerd and this is what i think about why the fuck do we have online tournaments if they don't matter 
But, like, what's the point of online tournaments if they are irrelevant, according to, for example, Artosis? I understand that online tournaments don't have nearly the same level of prestige as an offline tournament, especially if you only ever play online. But just because a tournament is played online does not mean that it doesn't have any value. I think that's pretty stupid. Right? Like, if you've proven that you can win at offline tournaments, and then you go ahead and win a whole lot of online tournaments, I don't think that makes the online tournaments irrelevant. Like, I wouldn't give them the same level of value as an offline event, but still think they have value. Serral's offline win rates versus Preans is 62% in games, 69%. And again, nice. these are versus Maru, Dark, Beyond, Hero, Cure, Solar. I mean, you have to scroll pretty far down. No, I, I genuinely think... Ardo, uh, like, Artosis does not consider Max Pax to be a legitimate player at all until he plays an offline event. 100%. Yes, I do think that. Find some Koreans that are not necessarily top, top level players like Quanta. And then even also, that, also, you know, we're also excluding every region locked tournament. So in StarCraft 2, there are region locked tournaments, right? Like, for example, tournaments that you can only enter if you are a European citizen, right? Same for, can be said for, for example, the North American competition. You can only participate in those when you are a North American, right? Makes sense. The Korean ones technically aren't region locked. So, you know, I could fly to Korea and participate in the GSL Code S. The only thing is that the GSL Code S runs for like two months. So you kind of have to be in the country for like three months. That is not technically a region lock in the strictest sense of the word. But, in a very real way, <laughs> you can, like, if you win the GSL Code S in 2024, you get, like, 5,000 bucks at most. I, I don't know. Like, it's not technically region locked, but you do have to commit a very significant chunk of your life for pennies. It doesn't really make any sense. It's literally more expensive to fly to Korea from Europe than it, the money you would earn winning the entire event. So, like, there is zero reason for a lot of these guys to go to Korea. Guys like, for example, Raynor do it because he likes going. <laughs> so he just thought it would be fun, and Raynor is that kind of guy that does that. But for somebody like Serral, who is not really in it for the prestige or whatever, he doesn't give a shit, why, why would Serral ever go to Korea? It's not technically region-locked, but I find it a little disingenuous to... Pretend that GSL is like the greatest of all tournaments ever, and then to say that like the European tournaments don't count and the North American tournaments are irrelevant. Like I find that I find that a little silly. I have to scroll even further down to find more like that. Rogue, on the other hand, because it's cold and sending for sure. Yes, is fifty-seven percent and sixty percent, so almost five and ten percent lower respectively. And he's playing versus. Other Korean players that simply are just padding his win rates, like Lunacy, and again, Quanta. So, he should have a higher win rate if he was just better than Cyril, but his win rate's actually lower. Okay, just a, a few things here. Uh, first off, these are not all offline events, obviously. Um, a lot of this is online. Also, I should yeah. mention that... There's uh, a ESL Open Cup, there's a Kung Fu Cup, those are all online. Rogue, the majority of his games you're going to find are played in preparation style tournaments as opposed to weekend tournaments. So just some small things. But uh, even preparation though style tournaments, as in just the GSL Codes. Right? I think that's it. See here a difference uh, in win percentage, 5 to 10%. As I believe uh, Fear Dragon says, uh, that 5 to 10% is not something that I think. Uh, is more valuable than winning a bunch of GSLs. <laughs> Going from 60% win rate to, what was it? 70-something is actually ridiculously hard. But anyways. The difference uh, in win percentage, 5 to 10%, as I believe... Uh, like, the, the says. amount of extra wins you have to get at that point is insane. Uh, that 5 to 10% is not something that I think... Uh, is more valuable. Than I think what it all comes down to is that Artosis puts a lot of value on the GSL Codes, when in reality, 
it's a good tournament. It's really fun. I think it's a really cool format. But it's not quite at the same... Like, I would say that, for example, the Dallas event that just wrapped up this weekend is a much harder tournament than GSL Codes. Even though it's a weekend tournament and even though it takes place over the course of just a few days compared to, like, two months, I think it's actually a harder tournament to win. Anyways. A bunch of GSLs. In those offline events. Those uh, are not now. all, again, oh, okay. not, not offline. Like, we see Kung Fu Cup. Hey, what's going on? Stuff, Fight so Shark. It's not all offline stuff. I, 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 I lack is not the uh, end all. Let's really quickly talk about <laughs> Serral versus Rogue as a head-to-head -head matchup. Now, I'll give you some credit on this one. I think head-to-head -head is irrelevant, but Serral wins that pretty dominantly. They are actually relatively even. But let's talk about offline win rate. And, oh, Serral's never lost to Rogue offline. I'm going to continue in part two because there is a bit more to cover. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so uh, Cyril obviously has a great record against uh, Rogue Offline. I don't really care about their online games. I am completely... So I, I just consider this a dominating record for Cyril there. But I don't think that Go is at all defined by what two players have done specifically against each other, but rather yes. what the players have won, right? That is the yes. Go real definition is the actual accomplishments, not necessarily what they've done against each other. Uh, you know, we have situations where there's like practice bone was and stuff, right? Uh, where there are players that actually have winning records against some of these champions, but it doesn't matter because it doesn't happen in, in, they don't have tournament victories, right? It's like, you don't care what your record is. What matters is if you win the tournament. Fair. Let's go to the next video. Okay, we're back. So we just covered win rate of head to head. Let's talk about. The like in my mind, this was a cool discussion in like 2021, you know? Like then I was already saying Sero was the greatest of all time, but Maru is kind of close, Roke is kind of close. But over like the last three years, Sero has continued to win basically everything. So like in my, in my mind, it's all, <laughs> it's all very settled. Like this discussion was closer three years worth of competition ago, but you know, here we are. What I think is interesting is that Sero and Rogue compete in the same time period. Like, it can be hard, for example, to compare Sero to, like, the domination of MC in the early days of StarCraft II. Or, like, for example, Teja. Right? Like, how in the world do you compare those two? Because they're different eras. But Rogue and Sero play in the same time period. So isn't it, like, maybe Rogue is ever so slightly earlier and he obviously went off to the military, but now Sero's in the military. I mean, it's roughly the same time frame rates of each one of these players since their first premier tournament victory which is just going to exclude all the all of their early like rising up in the scene kind of stage of things Cyril has a 75 percent game record win rate and an 87 percent series record win rate which is staggeringly high in the meanwhile rogue on the other hand is 64 and 71 percent still very very respectable rogue is still pretty freaking good but it's just nowhere near the level of domination that Cyril has had across his career ever since his first premier tournament victory. Let's talk about Liquipedia. Okay, uh, yeah, the win rate of Cyril is amazing. I've actually been on record multiple times saying I think Cyril is the strongest player in the world. Uh, he has reached the highest skill level anyone has ever reached. Uh, you know. Uh, um, has reached the highest skill level anyone has ever reached. Uh, you know, between this and, and the win rate, I understand that people are arguing that this makes him the GOAT. Uh, I explained before the difference between a Bonjwa and a GOAT. Just because someone's the... <laughs> you just said he had the... <laughs> You just said he's the greatest player to ever play the game. No? Am I crazy? What did I just miss? Okay. Uh, yeah, the win rate of Cyril is amazing. I've actually been on record multiple times saying I think Cyril is the strongest player in the world. Uh, he has reached the highest skill level anyone has ever reached. So being the greatest player in the world and reaching the highest skill level that somebody has ever reached are not the same thing, right? Because like there have been players that have peaked. But being the greatest player in the world is like the definition of being the greatest of all time, right? Am I crazy? Like, what am, what am I missing here? Yeah, so obviously he's going to argue that it's not just peak, but also 
time gated, right? So obviously, if you are the greatest player in the world for like two months, maybe it shouldn't count. But Cyril has now been winning everything since 2018. Like it's, <laughs> it's, it's not like this is like a sporadic moment where he's just kind of peaking and then he's he's drifting into nothingness again, right? Uh, you know, between this and and the win rate, I understand that people are arguing that this makes him the goat. Uh, I explained before the difference between a bone joint and a goat. Just because someone's the best at a given time doesn't mean that they're the goat. Uh, and like for instance, like LeBron James would smoke Michael Jordan in a one versus one. Does that mean controversial statement number seventy four of the video? I don't know enough about uh, sports. Um, maybe he means LeBron James against Michael Jordan in 2024. Because LeBron is like 20 years younger, I think, right? Maybe 30 years younger? I'm not exactly sure, but... I mean, does that... Is that what gives him GOAT status? No. Of course not. If he's saying prime Jordan versus prime LeBron, it would be a little confusing, right? Anyways. Of course not. Uh, so yeah, that, I, it's a weird comparison to make otherwise. Doesn't mean that they're the GOAT. Uh, and, like, for instance, like, LeBron James would smoke Michael Jordan in a one versus one. Does that mean... Probably, I guess. I don't fucking know. Does that it's always hard to like, but like that's not the discussion. See, that's what I, that's my problem with a lot of this. That is not the discussion because both Rogue and Serral play in the same time frame. I think Artosis' argument is that like when, when was Rogue's very first premier tournament win? Does anybody happen to know the data? I can look it up, I guess. We can have a quick little peek. Um, Rogue Liquipedia. Serral's very first Premier event was in 2017. So the first Premier tournament that Rogue won was in 2017. So Serral is one year later. You, you can't say that's a different time frame. That is the same... And this is even a weekend tournament that, you know, he would probably not even really consider. This is another weekend tournament that he wouldn't really consider. WCS Global Finals. Now, that one counts. Now, obviously, I very well know that Roke was much better earlier than Serral, but it's not... They didn't really start dominating around, you know... Uh, it, you know, it's not, it's not like Roke was around in Heart of the Swarm and Serral was doing really well right now. It's not really the case, right? Is that, is that what gives him GOAT status? No, of course not. Of course not. Uh, so, I, I don't know. I don't see that as as important as the actual accomplishments. Results. This is the list of premier tournaments that Cyril's won. I'm going to give you some credit on this. Some of these we don't need to include here. Like European specific tournaments, I agree. There's like three or four of those. There's also a couple. So if we're not going to include European specific tournaments, should we then also not include Korean specific tournaments? I know technically the GSL is not region locked, but I find it very disingenuous to fucking count the GSL like it's this godlike tournament and to completely invalidate all European events. For a little bit, I believe that the GSL was region locked, where like if you decided to play in the GSL qualifiers, you couldn't play in the European qualifiers, so you kind of had to like make a choice. I, I know that they changed the rules as far as that goes a bunch of times, so I'm not really 100% up to date, but I know there was some reasoning. I think it was like Scarlet who wanted to go to Korea, but then realized she probably shouldn't go because then she might not be able to play the North American one. I don't remember if that was just like a time frame or a server or a ping related issue or if it was actually like a rule, but... <sighs> I would argue that because players like, for example, Clem, like, for example, Saro himself. Like, because players like that don't play the GSL, it makes the entire tournament less important. Because the highest ranked players on the planet are not competing in that one. Right? Whereas, like, for these smaller weekend events, the ones that are Artosis does not seem to value quite as much, it's... I don't, I don't like this argument anymore. handful but. of these online events, we can exclude those. Even then, it is still a much larger list of tournaments than Rogue has. I know.
know that you don't want to include things like WCS Montreal and Valencia and Austin mm -hmm. and Leipzig. Why do we not count those? Why does Artosis not want to count WCS Montreal, Austin and Leipzig? What was the reason for that? I, I, I don't remember. Does anybody know? Those weren't region locked, right? Maybe they were region locked? Maybe they were region locked. Because but they... like, it's... It still seems insane to not count any of those. We're region locked, but I want to remind you that even... So this is versus Mana, this is versus Hass, versus Showtime. This is versus Rainer. Yeah, I think these were not like Koreans couldn't play those. GSL itself was region locked to an extent. It was soft region locked, where if you participated in GSL, I think every GSL is soft region locked. Though that's kind of what I'm trying to say. Like you, you have to commit so much time of your life for an irrelevant prize pool. It makes no sense. Especially for the year of like say 2019, for example, you were not allowed to compete in your region's uh, qualifiers for the big events. So Cero couldn't play in the European regional if he played in. GSL, same as how Scarlet and Rain Sorry, and David. many others did have to experience when they tried to play. Yeah. Okay, so if I'm not mistaken, that's not true. Uh, I'm I'm trying to remember back right now. Uh, I also don't know the exact details. Uh, unless I'm misremembering, there was never any sort of rule like that for GSL. Uh, I seem to recall like... Regarding the soft region lock for one season, it was enforced in 2019 that if you played in the GSL, you couldn't play the regionals. It's in the rule book, but they decided not to enforce it after season one. Okay, I see. Yeah, because that, that was a lot of drama in the making, right? Like, I guess there never really came a lot of drama out of it, but fair enough. So they did soft region lock it at some time, and I think before that, players may have been a little hesitant about it all. Special, very. But honestly, I would say because you have to commit so much of your time, to go to Korea, I think every GSL CODIS, in a sense, is region locked, right? Like if we're calling, if we're having hard region locks, which is what Artosis is saying, hard region lock, European tournaments, those don't count at all. I think the GSL is like a soft region lock, in the sense that you have to actually commit a very significant portion of your life there for a price pool that is not very significant at all, is not going to make you a profit in any way consistently playing in both GSL and winning all the LADAM stuff. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure there was never any rule that if you played in GSL, you could not play Apparently there was. Uh, in, your, in your other tournament. But only for one season. So I, I do not believe that that is true. In GSL. Rogue does have a fair number of first place finishes, but I want to note actually his second and third place finishes, just his top four Rogue won once in May of 2021. Was that a tournament that the non-Koreans could go to? Because that was in the middle of COVID. Could I have competed? Could Cyril have competed in the GSL Season 1 of 2021? Was that during COVID? Maybe it was, I don't know. Placement is a lot lower compared to, say, Cyril's as well. And I think that's also something just to note about consistency that Cyril has. Let's move on. Okay, I, I need to hit on that a little bit, uh, what he was just talking about, uh, between all these things, right? So he actually also placed... Yeah, but uh, like, if we're saying it's hard region locked during COVID, right? And we are not counting the European tournaments during that time period, but we are counting the Korean tournaments during that time period. Isn't that just straight up cherry picking results? Uh, a graphic like i know it was very tricky to go to korea for some time in the first place and he so. posted this video so i want to point this out right because people are looking at my list they're like that's not right and he gave me right he gave me that like the online stuff is not mattering as much and he gave me uh that i think you shouldn't have given this fear dragon <laughs> so we're not counting so many of these fucking tournaments that Cyril has won that are categorized as premier tournaments um just because you know it helps out, but I don't agree that those don't don't count. As a matter of fact, I think I wouldn't count the home story cups necessarily. Because they're a little bit of a different type of tournament, even though, you know, I think they're really cool tournaments. I don't think you can really put a home story cup at the same level as like a, I don't know, Dreamhack Starcraft 2 Masters Full. Which was a 4-0 against Trap in the finals there, apparently. Like, I, that I don't... region lock stuff shouldn't 
shouldn't really like even though right? that is an so online event and like the home story cups are offline i don't think that Anyways. i didn't look through this list that he posted okay i have that included this was online this was online yeah i have that included team look at star league nine that's i think that's a kind of fair one that's offline. That's like um i think the that finals was were part online and part offline it did have yeah. an offline like i want to say top eight if i'm remembering correctly so that is that's somewhat reasonable i i could i could absolutely be swayed towards that home story cups i did mention i did talk about but we're talking about the most prestigious tournaments that there are and home story Cup yeah, exactly, is not the dragon. same as like a dream hack or a gsl or an iem or anything like that i think everyone agrees with that even though liquipedia liquipedia is not like in charge of this it's a great resource but you do not put like a premier tournament i am katavice 2024 does that mean because this is on the same list that this is as prestigious no no it does not it does not okay so let's keep going I am Katowice 2022. I have that on there. Next, 2021, that was online. Home Story Cup, I talked about. That's on there. Home Story Cup, I talked about. I think about. Home Story Cup 20 should count. That one was very different than the others. That one was in Berlin. But anyways. That's on there. We're cherry picking so much as it is. I'm not even going to get into the details. That's on there. So we're looking at this list, and this is this is actually just not genuine because I did talk about Home Story Cup, and like you, you could count that. You could keep going down. Uh, the tiers of tournaments, but I think everyone would agree that... that no, these are all premier tournaments. So there's three tiers of tournaments. These are all premier tournaments. Now, I would say that there are some tournaments that are more important. It seems like Artosis agrees because there are, in his lists, there are world championship tournaments. And those are obviously premier tournaments because that's as high as we go in StarCraft, but... ...is a bit lower. And I did include everything else. Maybe Team Liquid Star League uh, is one that could count. Now, here is... Here is a, a comparison, right? So, and in fact, the video that I made was before Dallas. And uh, obviously, Cyril just won Dallas. Congrats to him. Amazing victory. So dominant. Looked great. Yeah, Rogue played like a bit of a donkey, eh? But we're not... Okay, anyways. Uh, let's take a look. I'm going to add that to the list. Even. <laughs> he just okay. came back from the military. All right, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. Okay, so this is the completed, based upon what... No, 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 no. Artie, come on, man. This this is just Bro, if if this is how we are determining who the goat is, why is Maru not the goat? According to according to Artosis' own reasoning, how do how is Rogue the goat and not Maru? He's won, yeah, he's won a load of GSLs, a lot more than Rogue. I'm starting to I'm starting to wonder if Artos is just being contrarian, just to do it for the content. I <laughs> I don't know, but I know he's been saying that Rogue is the goat for a long time. <sighs> like in my mind, Maru has been doing this since like fucking 2013 or whatever. He's been doing it for a lot longer than Rogue has. It kind of feels to me, if that is not the case, that Artosis has decided once upon a time, you know what? Rogue is the GOAT. And then we started looking at the data to try and argue that point, rather than looking at the data and drawing a conclusion from it. Right? Which is a very backwards way of deciding anything. I find this... Uh, I don't like this. Here, and what I've said. Bothers me. This, is, this would be the completed uh, list that he has <laughs> being added on, right? So what the three How the story fuck cups, is it, this the completed list? Let's be fucking real here. We counted like... When I counted it last, I think Cyril had like 27 Premier Tournament victories. Now, I will say that some of the Premier Tournaments are less Premier than others. So we can't really count all of them, but my fucking God. PSL 9, which was half offline and half online. And then the DreamHack Dallas that Cyril just won, which was fantastic. So are we trying to say that that is equal? Well, the thing about a Masters Coliseum is that the Masters Coliseum first place price is like five times that of a GSL code S. So like, sure, I wouldn't call the Masters Coliseum as prestigious, but there's still going to be a lot of really good players competing in a tournament like this. To the quality of four GSL code S. 
Well, honestly, right now, like if you look at a GSL code S right this second, I think that like DreamHack Dallas is actually probably a better tournament win. Yes. Than like a GSL code S right now. It's not even close. I don't think that that was always the case with DreamHacks or no. IEMs or anything like that. But I think right now you could say that and I would be like, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I don't think that you can take this. I think that this is the major uh, the major thing that me and everyone else on earth are disagreeing with. <laughs> GSL Code S has value. And I think that you can see here, I don't think anyone would But think if that the GSL Code S has value, all of those European heart region lock tournaments have value too. All of those online tournaments also have value. Maybe the GSL is not region locked in the strictest sense of the word, but it still kind of is. The TSL 9 and the three home story cups are better than four GSLs. No, of course not. Right? I don't think so. Okay, let's keep going. Let's, let's move on really quickly because I want to be fast. Uh, win rate or prize money won. Yeah. Cyril is just one more. Like, I don't like putting prize money into this. Me neither. Uh, different amounts of prize money were given at different times. Does that mean that that player is better? Uh, I don't. I really don't think so. I See, think but that's the, the thing, though. Roke is playing at the same time as Cyril. Like, Roke's first premier tournament win was in 2017. Cyril's first premier tournament victory was in 2018. These are not vastly different time periods. Most people would agree with me on this. I think if you're trying to boil it down to who won the most money, it's like... Oh, I don't, I, it, Cyril has been in a lot of, a lot more tournaments than Rogue yeah. and a lot of region lock tournaments in a weaker region than where Rogue lives, right? He just, he, there's more. So that is an important argument. Rogue. Rogue does not have the option to play in nearly as much stuff as Cyril. In general, the Korean scene is just not quite as active as the non-Korean scene. There's a lot more tournaments to play in. So I guess you can give him that. Starcraft 2 is much more popular in Europe and North America than it is in Korea, right? So it makes sense that he's made a lot more money. I also think, now that I think about it, sorry, I know I pause every five seconds, but these tournaments that are formatted like the GSL, right? Where the tournament runs for like a month and a half or two months or historically, I think even longer than that. You can't really do that anywhere else, right? Like the nice advantage of everybody living in Korea and everybody pretty much living in Seoul is that everybody also happens to live close, <laughs> right? Everybody is kind of right there. So like, even if you wanted to do a similar thing in Europe, you can't, you can't. like it's, the place is too big. Same for North America. You can't just do like a, you know, if everybody in North America lived in, like, I don't know, Los Angeles, then, you, yeah, I guess you could do a, a GSL type of tournament. But <laughs> you, you, you can't, because not everybody lives in, you know, in the same place. For Seoul, it's kind of convenient, because everybody's there. Significantly more, like 140 or something percent more. There's something to be said 40. about this meme over but here, but... No. Just, yeah, dude, Cyril is so much more consistently better statistically than Rogue. Why are we even talking about this, Dan? Why are we bringing this up? Why for the content. Why are we bringing this up? Anything for the content, baby. Up. Well, you know, when I saw everyone trying to argue whether Ro uh, rather Maru or Cyril were the goats, that kind of like, uh, that shocked me. That shocked me because I don't think you can really <laughs> compare Maru to Cyril because Cyril's one. Wait, that shocked you, Artie? Come on, man. Sorry, I stopped listening when he used the word shock. Well, you know, when I saw everyone trying to argue whether Ro, uh, whether Maru or Cyril were the goats, that kind of like, uh, that shocked me. That shocked me because I don't think you can really compare Maru to Cyril because Cyril's won way more of the international tournaments. Maru just doesn't have those big tournament wins which I think are important, but somehow he was still considered for the running because of all of his GSL victories. Well, guess what? Rogue has four GSLs and then like pretty much equal numbers on the other super prestigious tournaments uh, that Cyril has. So to watch Rogue be completely ignored, look, I know that Cyril and Maru basically have the most fans in the scene, but it doesn't matter if you're a fan or not. It doesn't matter if you think that Rogue's wins 
were like he, a lot of times I remember when he would win, it's like, oh, this abusive nidus worm stuff or something. But the thing is, he consistently has won so well. That's many not even an argument I thought of yet. The ways in which Roke has won his premier tournaments are, in my mind, quite a less, quite quite a bit less impressive than the way Sarah has been winning. Roke has abused many very cheesy bullshit strategies over the years, and that's fair. It still counts. But those are like tournament strategies that you can only play for like one, maybe two tournaments, right? Like he obviously has played Macro too, but... <sighs> and he's won a better spread, a better spread than everyone else. So I think that my argument is, uh, is pretty valid there, but I do want to thank Fear Dragon for actually <laughs> responding instead of just brushing it off. Uh, anyways, I if responded. you disagree, try to let me know. Wait, 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 this video is... Hold up right now, this this video is intellectually... What was it? Disingenuous? I'm not exactly sure. Uh, it's a 15 minute one, dude. I... Anyways, thank you very much. Memory. Gifting a community sub. Oh, without just acting like I'm crazy? I think that this is a very reasonable argument that I'm presenting. And again, I think that Cyril is the strongest player that there has ever been. That does not mean that you're the GOAT. That does not mean that you're the GOAT. Who so we keep saying that Cyril is the greatest player to have ever played the game, but that does not mean he's the greatest of all time. What are we, like, what are we arguing here? I don't quite understand. Like, if he is the greatest player to have ever played the game, but he is not the GOAT. Like, what the fuck are we even arguing? I don't understand. This is the second time Artosa says it in a video. ...argument that I'm presenting. And again, I think that Cyril is the strongest player that there has ever been. That does not... So I think he's trying to say, like, for example, if you look at, like, traditional sports, right? A record from, like, the 90s, 1960s is not nearly as impressive as it is in 2024. Because I'm pretty sure... I don't really know any... Uh, you know, say, like... The 10 kilometer run or whatever, right? I'm assuming all the top runners are 10 times quicker. Okay, maybe not 10 times quicker, but like substantially quicker than the best runners from like, you know, 50 years ago. Yeah, so being the strongest player in the world does not necessarily... I feel like that argument works if StarCraft 2 was 50 years old and we actually could like, you know argue that like hardware has gotten better and just the community's knowledge has gotten substantially better too. But Roke and Serral play in the same time period, man. <laughs> it's it's not like, you know. Yeah, like Formula One may be a good example. Because in the 90s, pit stops used to take forever. And now it's very common. Like normally, normally in, in 2024, a quick pit stop is right around two seconds. So they changed all the tires in two seconds, right? That is very impressive. Maybe 30 years ago, that was closer to like 10 seconds or so. So you can make that argument that like, yeah, maybe Verstappen is like the fastest driver in the world, but he wouldn't be the greatest driver in the world because, you know, the technology from 30 years ago is not quite up to levels that we are at right now. I don't think you can make that same argument for StarCraft 2. I think that also is, by the way, what the LeBron versus, uh, what's the name? I'm forgetting the name right now. I think that's the point that Artosis was trying to make. That, like, because of modern progression and training methods and, you know, everything else. Jordan, right. Um, you can't really compare the two very easily. Because, you know, one is competing at a much closer to modern day level. So it's, it's a bit different. But not mean that you're the GOAT. That does not mean that you're the GOAT. Whoever is, like, the strongest player in any game, in anything, basically, in the most recent time, generally, that's actually the highest skill level that there's ever been. Yes. Even if there's, like, less competition right now. You can see this with, like, games like Tetris, for example, right? Like, there were really good Tetris players in the 90s, but the guys that are playing nowadays are fucking insane level keeps going up for anyone who's trying that stupid argument uh the skill level is still going up so the people who are winning tournaments now are of course better than anyone that won tournaments in the past mvp cannot measure up right no but that doesn't mean that we can't have a goat that isn't currently the best player that's i think that's, that that's fair silly okay anyways thanks for watching but that's that's still <laughs>
Maybe if Rogue had done everything he'd done in like 2012, then we could make this argument, but I don't think it's very relevant in the current day and age, because Rogue is an active competitor, Serral is an active competitor. You can say maybe that Rogue had to do his military service, so he kind of had to like retire from the game, and because of that it feels like Rogue has been playing for a lot longer than Serral, and he has been playing for several years longer than Serral. But he didn't win his first premiere event until 2017. Serral won his first premiere one in 2018. I think there are a couple people that could be considered the GOAT, yeah. <sighs> I wonder how Rogue feels about this mess? I don't think the pro gamers really care. Serral doesn't give a shit, dude. There's no way Serral is gonna go to Korea just to shut up the haters. There's no way. It's never gonna happen. <sighs> oh well. Oh well. No, I'm not gonna make a response video to this sort of thing. I don't really wanna feed the drama any more than there needs to be done, but... Like, at which point would Serral be considered a goat in Artosis' mind? Like... It feels like we are kind of looking at absolute numbers of tournament wins, fair enough. Does he need, like, one more? Does he need, like, two more? Are we gonna look at, like, three more? Does he need to win a GSL? Like, when is it relevant? But if, if you know, Serral goes to Korea right now, and he wins a GSL Code S, right? Hypothetically speaking, because that's not gonna happen. I'm pretty sure Artosis would make the argument that the GSL Code S wins in 2024 are not as meaningful as a GSL Code S win as it was in 2019. Like, you can, you can literally not, you know, we can't time travel, we, we, <laughs> you can't really make the arguments then. Yeah, Serral also did win a rank roulette. I feel like that is something we need to discuss. Now, I don't want to flex or anything, but I won two rank roulettes. Ryaness! Ryaness recognizes the GOAT. Thank you for the five gift subs. I find this a pretty fun, I find this a pretty fun discussion. I do like it. It definitely is enjoyable, but it just feels like such a bad take. I have watched every video that Artosis has uploaded arguing that Roke is the GOAT, and none of them have even remotely convinced me. Roke has never even participated in a rank roulette. How does it, what does anything, how does any argument even work out? When I think of like Roke tournament wins, I think of all those abusive, broken strategies that he used to win. <laughs> like, that's what I think of when I think of Rogue GSLs. Now, I know that at some point, Rogue had, like, the best late game in the world. Which is fair enough. And he definitely didn't always play those abusive strats. But a lot of those wins that, that he has had were based off of those, you know, cheesy build orders. And in my mind, Serral was, I mean, he's mixed in a cheese or two, but very rarely. <sighs> We're doing a little sponsored stream for World of Tanks later today. If you guys want to join me, exclamation point W-O-T, you can also click the panel below the stream. Basically, long story short, if you use that link, you get a whole lot of in-game goodies. And it takes, like, the game is pretty big. So if you want to play together with me, um, and you want to download the game, you may need a couple extra hours. So I figured I'll just put the overlay on screen a little early, so maybe we can play some games together. Is an extractor trick a little cheesy? Yeah. Absolutely. Maybe life is the number one? That's... That's a very... That's a very controversial statement. Thank you very much, Mickey, for the support. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, I, uh, maybe I should hide it for now. I think it's okay. Artos is coping so hard. He like Skip Bayless? The fuck is this guy saying? Anyways, can a rushing in a world championship finals instantly make you the GOAT? SOS is the GOAT of StarCraft 2. Very nice. I agree, man.
<laughs> Let me know when Serol wins a GSL. Until then, it's all cope. Serol has won two GSL versus the world. He's won every tournament he's played in Korea. But anyways, apparently we're not, you know, we're not counting those either, huh? Because they're weekend tournaments. <laughs> I was looking for this. LeBron James would not smoke MJ in a 1v1. Are you kidding me, Artie? <laughs> Can't be the GOAT if you've never been a Bonchwa. Rogue has never been a Bonchwa. Rogue will never be GOAT. I'm surprised. I'm surprised Artosis took the bait. I'm I'm very surprised. This this is very obvious YouTube common bait. I'm I'm a little I'm a little surprised Artosis decided to respond. <sighs> Even if like Serol, according to Artosis, is not the goat, but he's considered a Bonchwa, I guess the Bonchwa that he's running on right now is since 2018. So he's been the Bonchwa since 2018 aka like fucking like nearly half of the entire game's lifespan like <laughs> okay maybe not quite half but oh yeah yeah okay i'm done i'm done we're not gonna talk about this anymore guys this has gone on for long enough it is definitely uh, i'm sure there's gonna be more layers to this don't worry we'll come back to this we'll revisit this in like an, an, uh, an another week or so Somebody else will make a reaction video, and then Artosis is gonna have to make a reaction video again to the reaction video. Yeah, we'll, uh... We'll get to it. Bing can make StarCraft memes? Ooh, we can have Bing make a StarCraft meme? Make... A StarCraft meme... About... A Zerk player... Crying... Because Zerk is underpowered. But it's actually not. Okay, let's see. <laughs> it is me! It looks exactly like me! Look at this fucking loser playing Zerk with a controller. I think that's your problem, man. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Why is he wearing a flannel? I guess the Zerk is the monster? Yeah. Maybe that's right. Zerk GG. Ooh, very nice. Such bad AI art? What? I think this is beautiful. I actually think it's kind of good. It even has five fingers. Five fingers is not easily done, man. Draw a picture of a Protoss player winning a premier StarCraft II tournament. This hasn't happened in real life in a very long time. So at the very least, we can have AI generate an image for us. Okay, he's gonna make it. I'm excited. Is that a picture of Max Pax? It could be. Protoss player winning a Premier StarCraft 2 tournament. Look at that. Oh my lord. It is Max Pax. <laughs> Whoa, sh dude. He showed up in a hood. Amazing. Draw me a picture of a Zerg and a Protoss player falling in love. Let's see. I'm excited. This is basically the plot of all of StarCraft 2. Yeah. You choose to believe that that first picture is a neat max packs? Yeah, could be. He looks very dainty. <laughs> a Zerk and a Protoss falling in love. Why do they look like alien? Like they look like alien aliens. Can you feel the love to <laughs> This one's actually so sick. I mean, none of them look like Protoss, but still. Very cool. Draw a picture of someone who believes that Rogue is the StarCraft 2 GOAT instead of Serral. I don't know, man. It could be anything. <laughs> what is this? I mean, it's beautiful. Don't get me wrong. I love it, but... Whoa, whoa. Someone who believes... Oh, I meant that. Anyways, someone who believes the rogue in the StarCraft 2 GOAT instead of... What? Okay, well, my prompt was maybe not perfect. I'm gonna try and do that prompt again. Draw a picture of someone who believes that rogue is the StarCraft 2 GOAT instead of Serral. For some reason, I could not type. Maybe it auto-corrected it or something. I don't know. 
I will try to create that. Perfect. Oh! Wait. Draw a picture of someone who believes that StarCraft- or that Rogue is the StarCraft 2 GOAT instead of Serral, and it can't do it? Maybe I should do GOAT? Yeah. Okay. Right. Draw a picture of someone who believes that Rogue is the StarCraft 2 greatest of all time. StarCraft- Okay. Alright, alright. The perfect prompt has been crafted. Draw a picture of someone who believes that Rogue is StarCraft 2's greatest of all time instead of Serral. Alright. Alright, I think we got it. I'll try that. Okay, do it. He can't do it. He can't do it. It's not possible, chat. I'm sorry. Make an image of a loco TV fan. Make an image of a loco TV fan. Alright. Is it going to draw a picture of you guys? Please describe a more... Pr okay, a descriptive prompt. Uh, make an image of, make an image of a loco TV fan who watches the live stream from home. Here we go. Maybe that's better. Copilot seems lame. I like Copilot. It's, it's doing it. It's making a picture of you guys right now. This is what you guys are going to look like. I'm excited. I'll finally be able to put a name to... Really? Hmm, that's- <laughs> that's me, Loco? Oh no, really? <laughs> Very nice. Clem is a massive fan of my stream, dude. Loco TV fan who watches the live stream from home. This is definitely Clem. He's got a- yeah, he's got a big, big ball of popcorn, yeah. Oh yeah, there you go. It's true. <laughs> Bleen loan? What does that mean? What is that hair? Stop being jealous, Philippe. This is some amazing hair, okay? Lock TV. 33 viewers? Look, 33 viewers is better than no viewers, okay? And as long as Clem is watching my content, that's all that really matters. You guys are a lot more Gen Z than I realized. Yeah, I thought some of you- I, I thought most of you would be a little older. Yeah. Make a VTuber avatar for Loco. Does that work? I have no idea if that works. Do I have to be better with my prompts? I don't know if it knows who I am. Like, I tried making it- I don't know. It doesn't seem to know who I am. Loco who? That's basically what it asks. Yeah. It's a little toxic, but it is what it is. Why? How? No! No! What the heck, man? That's... No! That's not me! No! That's still not... That's not me, bro! This, according to the internet, should be my VTuber avatar? There are a lot of cats. I do have two cats. That's true, I guess. How does it- where, how does it think it's me? Bro, that's Twitch chat, look at that. That's you guys right there, too. I don't- no, this one makes me uncomfortable, dude. I don't like this one. I don't like this one at all. Mm. Add a Loco TV logo on their headset. Caption, when the APM isn't enough to pay the bills? What the heck? This is one of the automated suggestions. When the APM isn't enough to pay the bills? What the hell? This is a dangerous one, too, dude. I feel like it's gonna ask me to subscribe to their OnlyFans. I'm, I don't know what's going on. This one's a little dangerous. Copilot knows me too well. Apparently so, dude. When the APM isn't enough to pay the bills? <laughs> what? StarCraft 2 live streamer with a caption when the APM isn't enough to pay the bills. Oh, yeah, no, that's true. True. Big true, actually. That's exactly what I look like when I take my shirt off. And I put on a helmet. For some reason. And I paint my body green. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is, uh, accurate. I will not have anybody tell me that it's not. Oh, okay. Why is my, why is my drink smoking? Why is my, why do I have two mice? Hell yeah, dude. That's me on the weekend. Yeah. I have a bowl of oranges. 
I have a lot of pencils. I have multiple health potions on my desk as well. And apparently one sandwich. Yeah. I might be a druid? I might be. I'm counting money. That's what I'm doing. That's what I do on the weekend. Yeah. I just have money lying around, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just piles of it. Clearly. Alright guys, I think we learned a lot here. It's US dollars? Of course. Why would I have any other currency? Of course it's American. Alright, I think that's it, right? Do we need any more prompts? Are we good? Can we do some more StarCraft? Draw a picture of the man inside of the missile turret. I've been wondering about that guy for a long time. Who's inside of the missile turret, chat? Why does he wear a helmet? What does the man in the missile turret truly look like? Add a tiny ladder for him to climb out of? Make it... The man inside of the missile turret! Wow, he looks kind of amazing! Holy sh look at this! I'm starting with the man in the missile turret. This one's amazing, actually. Make it a gif of him spinning. It needs to be spinning, otherwise these these look very stationary to me. This one's really good, dude. I love this one. This is genuinely awesome. Yeah, maybe it's a promotion to become a missile turret man. I've never really thought about it that way, but... Being a missile turret is kind of maybe like the marine retirement program. Oh, shh. Okay, okay. Well, these are a little larger than what I normally, uh... It didn't make it a GIF, by the way. I thought it would make it a GIF, but... Okay. It's like a weird spider mine type of thing. Very cool. StarCraft 3 confirmed? Starting to get that vibe. <laughs> Hyper-realistic Loco TV casting a StarCraft 2 match in an ESL tournament? Why the f do I have a gun pointed at my monitor? Why am I left-handed? I don't want to be left-handed. All these gamers are left-handed. All the mice are on the left. It's a very StarCrafty gun. Yeah. Maybe it's because my mouse goes in the left hand and my gun goes in my right. That that would explain it. Why do all the pictures of me have a beard? Dude, I should grow a beard. It's just that I can't. I'm poking pretty hard here, man. Either that or I'm trying to eat the microphone. Because that microphone is very bendy. It's looping back into my mouth. This looks like kind of like a sick RTS game, to be honest. That kind of looks good, man. The AI doesn't know what a loco TV is. Their loss. Okay, so I'm trying to go... to my marker. Marker 1. You were scared for a second? Don't be scared, Quinshin. Oh no. <laughs> Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Rip horsey? I died too, Motlesses! You care more about my horse than about me. I get it, actually. Most horses are quite innocent. Most of them. I'm sure there are jerks out there, though. I don't know much about horses, but I feel like there's gotta be some horses out there that just have really personalities. Like, they, like, show up late at the movie theater. And then they still use their phone's flashlight to try and find their seat. And they, they, like, probably have, like, a seat all the way in the middle. So, like, you know, everybody has to get up. It's really annoying when you have four, four legs. And they never have their wallet. Yeah, they always forget their wallet, right? It's like the first time, okay, mistakes happen. But then the second time, it becomes a little clear, huh? That's when you realize you can't really be friends. Yeah. Okay, there's supposed to be one right over here. What? What's this? <laughs> that was terrifying, man. Although you do have beautiful nails. You do have beautiful nails. You nailed it. You nailed it. His manicurist? Damn, what this is. That is a hell of a word. He needs to tip his manicurist. Starcraft expertise linked to enhanced brain connectivity. Bro. My brain. I, I knew my brain was special. My mom told me I was special. Yeah, no, this is definitely true. 100% true. Factual. My brain's massive, bro. I've got so many wrinkles. Video games and neuroplasticity. 
See, you guys didn't even know what that word is. You didn't even know what that meant. Yeah, but I play StarCraft, so I do. StarCraft 2 expertise linked to enhanced brain connectivity. Yeah, your brain's kind of like a smooth bowling ball. Mine is like, I've got wrinkles inside of my wrinkles, dude. Is it like plastic? Yes. In a recent study, <laughs> researchers explored the impact of playing real-time strategy video games on brain connectivity. They found that extensive gameplay, specifically in the RTS genre, is associated with significant differences in the brain's structural and functional connectivity. The findings have been published in a journal on neuroimage. Alright. This, this is gonna be the nerd shit, isn't it? Yeah, this is gonna be the nerd shit. Where we get our VGPS, where the N is 31, and we get our generic fMRIs and that sort of shit. Yeah. Yeah, fu functional connectivity categorized by meso scale I in integration. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so basically what this means, guys. My brain, my brain, right? I can, I can interpret words sometimes. They tested this on a grand total of 62 participants. So... Video game players and guys that aren't video game players. So, uh, can you draw any conclusions? Oh my god. They did, they did dive pretty deep though. So can we, is there, is there more... How do we find, like, the details of the actual test groups? How do I... How do I find this? Participant recruitment. 64 right-handed male subjects participated in this study. Get out of here, lefties. If you're a lefty, get out of here. Yeah. Too late? No. <laughs> 64 right-handed male subjects participated in this study. Two subjects were excluded from the analysis because of their bad quality of MRI data. Yeah, these were probably lefties pretending to be righties. Let's be real here for a second. That's why we had bad quality of their MMR, MRI data. I think that makes a lot of sense. 62 participants in the end. All subjects completed an online questionnaire about demographics, education level, and video game playing experience. Alright. Inclusion criteria for the RTS group. Mean age was 24.7 years old. What? I think the mean age for a StarCraft player is like 36. Anyways, the RTS group was experienced in RTS and StarCraft 2. Alright, they played RTS games at least 6 hours a week for the past 6 months. They declared playing StarCraft 2 for more than 60% of total gameplay time. They were an active player, played matches in at least the last two seasons. And they were placed in one of five StarCraft leagues. Gold, Platinum, Diamond, Master and Grandmaster. We're including gold players here too. Well, right-handed male gold league players. Okay, now fair, fair. The inclusion criteria for the people that didn't play StarCraft, they played less than six hours of RTS a week. Less than eight hours of total, okay, video games in total across all genre, okay. Yo, that actually surprised me a little bit. So they, okay. I thought they would have like no gamers going up against gamers, but that's not what it is. Only male participants were recruited due to the lack of female participants with adequate video gaming experience. <laughs> ah, there you go, chat. Yeah, no, no more sexism in the chat. We got this. They, they clarified it. They couldn't find any. Like, they would have, but they couldn't. They, they didn't, yeah, they, they just, fair enough. The average StarCraft player has 0 0.2 girlfriends. That's true. Okay, so this is, there's zero StarCraft 2 experience. They did have real, so what did they play? What did the, what did the non-StarCraft group play? They just didn't play a lot of games, they played some games. <laughs> the StarCraft 2 group scored zero in sports. Nice, chat. I agree, yeah, no, we, we, we definitely, no, we have a full-on zero when it comes to regular sports. We don't do any of that. Racing? 0 0.13. That's like a guy that played Mario Kart with his, like, little brother. Fair enough, fair enough. Multiplayer online battle arena. So that's a MOBA. Oh no. Are these League of Legends players? Hold up right now, chat. This study may be invalidated entirely. <clears throat> there are some League of Legends players in this group. So researchers explored the impact of playing RTS games with brain connectivity. They found that extensive gameplay, specifically in the RTS genre, is associated with significant differences in the brain's structural and functional connectivity. Alright, 
Video games have become a central part, previous research, our main interest, okay, blah, blah, blah. Why video games? So StarCraft players are literally superior? Is that what I've, is that what I've learned? Let me see. Make an image of a StarCraft 2 player who has a massive brain because he's better than other gamers and non-gamers. Here we go. I think it's scientifically proven now. That's how it works. No, correlation definitely equals causation. Yeah, I'm a bit of an intellectual myself, but it turns out you just play StarCraft. Very nice. There we go, Chet. Whoa, whoa, that's just, I think that's an average size brain. Like, they think this is a massive brain, but for a StarCraft player, that's just an average size brain. Yeah, yeah, no, this, this is what, it, this is an actual StarCraft brain right over here. Yeah. Oh my god, what? Why is he being shot at from so many angles? Yeah, this is more like a gold league brain right here. Like, still wrinkly, still impressive. This is what we're talking about, though. Yeah, this is just, this guy's head is just brain. Yeah. <laughs> Very beautiful. This, this is probably, yeah, this is probably a Protoss player. Protoss players are smarter. We all knew that. This could be max specs. Dude, StarCraft players have really good facial structure and everything too, man. Look at that. Yeah. No Zerk players though? No, no, no. Absolutely not. Um, so I don't have Adepts. I think I'm, I may very well need... Oh. There's two holes. Um, don't... The chat? There's two holes in my wall, to clarify. I don't... Jeez, no. Come on, man. I can't say anything. Now there's only one. No, now there's only one. Fake news. I'm mostly scared of Zerklings early on because I don't have Adepts. I don't know how reasonable my fears are. It's good to sometimes think to yourself, how reasonable are my fears? I'm a little afraid I'm just gonna have like a million Zerklings running in. This is one of the... <laughs> one of the build orders of all time. <laughs> it's so bad. There we go, we get a little bit of this, we get a little bit of that. We do a bit of queuing. We go for some gases. Hell yeah, dude. Damn, it feels good to be a Protoss. We Silver League now? What? Yo, 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 that's very toxic. Somebody get this Echo Steel guy out of my chat. I think powering my entire base with one pylon is a great idea. Give him a warning. Yeah, I can give him a warning now. I did make a pylon, didn't I? Yeah, I did. Just a little late. Reaver. Now I know what you're thinking, Reaver. I just, no, 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 no. What the hell is this? It's a bunch of bull is what it is, chat. Silver leak my ass, Echo Steel! <laughs> Would somebody in Silver League be able to hold? <laughs> don't think so. I don't believe it. Did I go for the upgrades? I did, I did. Maybe I won't hold, actually. I don't know. No, I might still not be able to hold. <sighs> okay, no, we're okay. We're okay. Slash ban Echo Soldier? No, it was Echo Steel. Normally Echo... I, I understand that you say Echo Soldier, because normally Echo Soldier is the toxic one, but he's not even here. But I believe... Yeah, we should just... Yeah, let's just ban Josh. Just to be sure. It's a safe bet. <laughs> he's gonna say something stupid at some point in the future anyways. May as well just get it over with.